Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me and the volume is not so bad. Just please interrupt me if there's any problem with seeing my screen or hearing the volume. So I want to thank you, the organizers, for the opportunity. I also want to say that I was in Vienna for the beginning of this event. I was there for the, the first few weeks of the workshop, the spring school, and I, I really enjoyed my time there. So I want to thank everybody involved for this opportunity and then to give the talk. Let's pretend that I'm still in there. The background that I have here for my Zoom meeting is my office at the ESI, where I'm not anymore. And OK, the title of my talk, this giant uh, six names here, it's going to be a system, uh, Einstein's equations coupled with some theory of electromagnetism. So I'm going to tell you what this is about. Uh, let me actually start by going to the very end first. This is just the references that I'm going to be talking about throughout the talk. So if anybody wants to take a screenshot or a picture of this now so you can see what they are later, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. And OK, I'm going to go back to the beginning. So let me start with describing what this problem is. Uh, I remember one of the talks uh, during the first two weeks and there was about a black hole. And somebody mentioned, even though uh, outside of this black hole, it was the vacuum space time. And so it didn't really fit the, the theme of the, the event in Vienna. Uh, you know, black holes still have uh, some, some content inside of them. So because of that, that talk, that particular talk fit the event. But now let's see about my talk, because this is electro vacuum and I have naked singularities. So I hope that people are not going to be so unsatisfied by this. But nevertheless, I think this is a pretty interesting topic. So this was part of my PhD thesis with Michael Kiesling and Shadi Tavodalzadeh at Rutgers in the United States uh, just last year. The general question, which I, I'll have not so much to talk about, this is the, the biggest question, essentially, can the Einstein equations of GR alone dictate the motion of point particles and the point particles are viewed as naked singularities. So we've seen a lot of talks here about fluids where you have a continuum of matter in your space time. But now let's imagine you have like two or three particles only. And these particles are modeled as singularities. So they are not actually in the space time. They're naked singularities. And the question is, does the Einstein equations alone dictate their motion? And depending on who you, who you ask, they may say yes or no, or this question has, has been answered by Einstein or no. It's a little controversial. Um, specifically now talking about charged particles. So in special relativity, what I'm going to be calling Maxwell-Maxwell electromagnetism, that's just the usual Maxwell equations, let's say. It turns out they are actually problematic if you want to consider this joint evolution of both the, the positions of the particles and the electromagnetism, electromagnetic fields, essentially because of something that's called the infinite self-energy problem. Namely, a particle, if you, if you calculate the electromagnetic energy, the, the energy in the electromagnetic field generated by a particle, at the location of the particle itself, it's infinite. So if you want to, to formulate a well-posed evolution problem for the particles in special relativity already, using the usual Maxwell equations, you cannot do that unless you do some renormalization procedures, which are not so, you know, not so nice, not so universally accepted, let's say. And the alternative theory that I'm, I'm going to be calling Maxwell BLTP, it works in special relativity. And then the question is maybe it also works in GR. This is still an unanswered question. And now specializing a little further, even before talking about two or more particles, what if you only have one particle then? This is the topic for today. So what does the space-time of one single static point charge look like if you assume this generalized Maxwell equations? Yeah, so is it is it gonna have a finite electric field energy? So Contrary to what happens with the usual Maxwell equations, the answer is yes. And then how bad is the singularity? The answer is not so bad as it would be in regular Maxwell equations. 
So this is a summary. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit about physics. About I'm going to give a nice introduction to this. How do we do electromagnetism in special relativity? All right. So special relativity or flat space. That's essentially what when I say flat space, I mean Minkowski space. So the Maxwell Maxwell or the usual Maxwell equations is composed of the following. There's the system of pre-max pre-metric Maxwell equations. So essentially, if you have a lot of particles, it could be a continuum distribution of particles with charge density rho and current density J. You can form two systems, not only for the fields B and E, electric and, and magnetic fields, they actually have different names in physics, but also fields D and H. It turns out this is the most general formulation, the most natural in some way of the Maxwell equations. And so the B and E show up in the homogeneous equations and D and H show up with the source terms. And then, so this is one part of the Maxwell here in the title. The other Maxwell is the so-called vacuum law. If you stipulate now that this mysterious field D is actually the same as E and then H is the same as B. So then you get the usual Maxwell equations for just B and E, but a more, a more general formulation involves the four fields, B, E, D, and H. All right. So Maxwell, Maxwell is the system that only has B and E, and th this is the simple vacuum law relating them. And I think most people have seen this already in tensor formalism, you can write these equations using tensors, but just to take care of this business, the D and H, what you do is you actually have two, two forms, F and M. So F is gonna have all the Bs and Es in it somehow as coordinates. And uh, it's a, a two form that satisfies the equation df equals zero. And then in, in simply connected regions of space time, this means that f is equal to dA for some uh, one form A. And then this field M must satisfy this equation uh, star J. So first of all, star is the Hodge star. And this big J is some vector or one form containing the source terms, containing the rho and the J, the little J. So that's, that's the formulation of these two systems up here. And then the stipulation, the relation between D and H, E and B in tensor uh, equation, it's M equals star F. Once again, the Hodge dual. That's how you formulate the usual Maxwell equations in tensor language. And I also wanna mention these equations come from a variation of principle. You can write a Lagrangian form, which is F wedge star F. And if you, if you integrate it on regions of your space time, you get something called the action. And by imposing zero variation of the action with respect to this A, which is the A that appears here, you get the, all these equations. All right. And now what is this BLTP and the, the generalization of Maxwell equations? This was independently proposed in the 40s, by, first by Bopp, then by Lande and Thomas, and then by Podolsky. So that's the BLTP. Most people just call it Bob Podolsky nowadays. It's a slight modification of this system. So you still have the same pre-metric equations, but the vacuum law relating the fields D and E and H and B is slightly different. There's a new constant. You can think of it as maybe a new constant of nature. It's this kappa. It has a dimension of one over length. And it's supposed to be a really big constant. So that one over kappa is really small. So the relation between, for example, D and E is D is equal to E minus, and then a small multiple of box E, where box is the wave operator. There is a reason for this particular law. Um, right? Essentially, that these people were actually trying to solve this problem that I mentioned of the infinite self energy. And this, this solves this problem in flat space. Uh, but there's also some natural ways to arrive at this formulation, this new law of electromagnetism. So in tensor language, the equations, the pre-metric Maxwell equations are the same as they should be, but now the relation between M and F changes. There's this extra term here, M is equal to star F plus some small multiple of, you know, there's two derivatives of F right here star D, star D, star F. 
accounting for the two derivatives appearing in the wave operator. And there's also a Lagrangian for this system of equations. Here is the modification comparing to the original Maxwell-Maxwell Lagrangian. We don't have to remember what these equations are or the Lagrangians are, it's, we just need to know that they come from a Lagrangian. And now let's say we, we specialize to our situation. Let's say we only have one particle in your universe with the charge Q and it's static. So it's sitting at the origin at all times. What is the solution to these equations? Uh, you can write everything in terms of R, the distance from the origin. There's not gonna be any magnetic fields, the B and the H, because you have, you have no electricity here flowing. It's just a static, static point charge. And in this table, I'm showing the usual Maxwell equations compared to this new formulation. Well, not new, it's from the 40s, this Maxwell BLGB formulation. So you can see what changes. This is called the Coulomb potential. You know, the, there is an electric potential in this theory. Essentially, your, your one form A is going to be minus phi, or actually phi, I think, as, as the first component. Um, so this, this is the electric potential. Uh, in Maxwell, Maxwell theory, it's something that diverges at r equals zero. It's q over r. It's called the Coulomb potential. In Maxwell BLTP, it's something that has a, an exponentially small correction. So for large r, it doesn't really matter. It, it looks just like the Coulomb potential. But for small r, it, it actually, this, this function has a value. It's, it's continuous at r equals zero. Yes. So F is still DA here, right? Yes. That's just by put by hand. Okay. Correct. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. So yes, the electric potential actually has a value at R equals zero. Already showing you how this how this theory fixes somehow problems that happen at the location of the charge. The D field turns out is the same, but the E field differs in the same way that as, as I showed you above. Uh, the E field itself is not defined at R equals zero because it's a multiple of the, the unit factor in the direction of R, right? But at least the magnitude of it is finite. You can say the magnitude of E converges to a value. This function here actually has a value at R equals zero. And the electric field energy, so the energy contained in the electric field of this particle, was infinite with usual Maxwell equations. And here it is finite. It actually has a value of phi of zero divided by two multiplied by the charge. And, and this energy is just some integral. This, there's a physical argument for this, uh, why this is the energy contained in the electromagnetic field. All right. So take this here above with a grain of salt. I don't remember if this is a phi or minus phi. It's one of the components of A but not so important. Uh, all right, so this, is, this was now the work of my advisors, still in flat space. If you have endpoint sources, uh, the question now again, how, how do you write equations of motion, equations of time evolution for their positions and velocities together with the field equations? So uh, my advisor, Michael Keesley, proposed a few years ago some some well-posed idea, at least, that works in this case of Maxwell BLTP. So essentially, it's energy and momentum balance laws. It's the, the natural thing that you would expect in a physical context. They must hold between sources and fields. So the, the particles and the fields exchange energy. And this shows you exactly why it's problematic to try to do this in Maxwell Maxwell, because there the, the, the energy of the field is infinite. But in, in my reference, KT, they show that you can actually do this in special relativity, locally at least. There is a locally well-posed system of, of evolution of points and, and uh, their fields. All right. I should also mention, I don't think any physicist actually believes that this theory is the correct electromagnetic theory, this BLTP thing. It's more like a playground, really. It's a, a, a small modification of the maximum equations that allows you to to have fun with it, with some mathematical results like this. Um, all right, so we can move on to discussing how electromagnetism works in general relativity now. So if you, I think everybody here will know this, if you 
uh, talking about some matter system in general relativity, then you have a space time, which is a four dimensional Lorentzian manifold with a metric with this signature that I use minus plus plus plus. You have the Einstein equations where, and this is uh, why I'm mentioning the Lagrangian, the, if you have a, a matter theory that has a Lagrangian for it, then you can obtain this T mu nu. There's a, a procedure for telling you what the T mu nu is in the, the source field of the Einstein equations. Of course, if the Newton gravitational constant G is actually equal to zero, which it's, it's not, but let's imagine we can make it zero, then the flat space, the Minkowski space, is a solution to the Einstein equations. Not the only solution, but of course it is a solution. Um, and normally the, the energy momentum local conservation equations, these equations for T mu nu right here, they are normally, depending on the context, they're considered the equation of, of motion of the matter in the fields. So they actually imply the classical equations of motion in many contexts, like in a fluid, for example. And they follow from the second Bianchi identity that's satisfied by the Einstein tensor. Um, now, if you're talking about matter that's just a bunch of point particles, like a finite number of them, this is the, then the, the situation that I'm interested in. The, the world line of a point particle, maybe you can model that as actually something that's not in the space time. So it's a time like curve, but not actually part of the space time being a little informal here. OK, and now let's imagine we want to talk about the space time of a static point source, uh, not specifying the electromagnetism theory yet. Let's say we have a theory given by a Lagrangian. So how does that work? How do you get equations for the space time of it? So consider a static, spherically symmetric space time, because if you only have one particle sitting at the origin, not moving the space time around it will be spherically symmetric and static. So consider that with a singularity corresponding to the world line of a particle of charge Q. So you have a you have your space time as R4 minus a line, but you want you want to write it in uh, spherically symmetric coordinates. So as I said, the choice of the electromagnetic theory to be used is made by stipulating a Lagrangian. With the Lagrangian, you build the T mu nu and then you build the Einstein equations. So you solve them. The general metric that you're going to have for this space time in these spherically symmetric coordinates, it has two unknown functions that I'm calling alpha and beta. And we have to assume also that a, a potential one form is defined in your space time. So I guess this answers my question from before. Uh, phi appears as the first coordinate of A. So yeah, we assume this, this phi function and this potential one form A exists on space time. So my problem has these three unknowns now, alpha, beta, and phi. If you want your space time to be physically meaningful, then you want it to be asymptotically flat, which means alpha and beta are going to one towards infinity, the metric coefficients. Plus, you, wanna, you want your space time to be what I'm calling asymptotically Coulomb, meaning away from this point charge, the laws of electromagnetism should look like what they do for Maxwell Maxwell, right? For the usual Maxwell equations. So the way I'm saying that here, first of all, there's this first equation that doesn't really, it's not so important. It's usually assumed for a potential that it's zero at infinity. But the second one, I'm gonna be considering an unknown chi in place of phi. So here's the definition of chi. So phi is almost not gonna appear anymore. Chi is gonna appear in place of it. And I'm saying that chi has to go to zero at infinity. If you think about what this means, so alpha and beta are already going to one at infinity. So forget about this alpha beta in the denominator. So to say that chi goes to zero essentially means that phi prime is approximately minus q over r squared. If you look at this, to set this equal to zero, right? And phi prime equals to this means essentially phi equals q over r together with this condition, the phi goes to zero. So you're saying that the electric potential is just like the Coulomb potential away from the charge. This is the asymptotic condition that you wish for the chi function. All right, so that's the recipe for building a space-time. And now if you take the Maxwell-Maxwell L, the usual Maxwell equations, 
this is well known. What you obtain as the solution is called the Reisner Nordstrom or Reisner via Nordstrom space time. I'm calling it RWN. And it has a free parameter in it, it has an M. So I'm, I'm writing this uh, semicolon M in the solution. So the alpha and beta metric coefficients are written like this. And the chi is just equal to zero for, for the RWN space time because phi is exactly equal to the Coulomb potential. And this parameter m turns out to be the ADMS of the space time. Uh, a fact that's not so well known, but again, so sim very simple to see. Essentially, this is saying if the, uh, if the mass is not so large, then the coordinate system is actually global. There's not going to be any horizons, uh, this, which means in this case that the beta function is never zero. So if you want to, if you're using this RWN space time to model just one point particle, then this is actually a naked singularity. If you want to model a star, like a charged star, then usually this will not be the case. It will actually have a, a black hole region, although this would normally be inside of the star anyway, so it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but for, for just one point particle, this is a naked singularity. And the field energy that you get from this is infinite. So just like in the flat space case, uh, you can get the field energy. It's, it's a certain meaningful integral involving the, the zero, zero component of the stress energy tensor. It comes out as infinite, essentially because of a, a problem at r equals zero. This integral diverges at r equals zero. There's another meaningful uh, curvature invariant that you can calculate at the singularity. It's called the Kretschmann scalar. It diverges as r to the eight or r to the minus eight as r goes to zero. So we're also using this as somehow of a measure of the how bad the singularity is. This this is a this is too fast of a divergence of this of the curvature at the singularity. So this is the R W N space time. And now I want to do I want to talk about some other. Uh, theory of electromagnetism called the Born-Infeld, because I want to compare later to, to what we can do with the BLTP theory. So this is now about reference T uh, by Tafel Darzade. In this reference, I think it's from 2016 or something, I forget. Uh, so the Lagrangians of electromagnetism theories are studied, which are functions of these invariants of, of the F, Answer. So this includes the, the most famous generalization of the Maxwell equation, which is the Born-Infeld generalization, but does not actually include our case of BLTP. BLTP unfortunately has more derivatives in the Lagrangian. It has also it has terms containing df and, and d star df. So in these for for all of this class of theories here, Tavel Darzade actually finds that the metric coefficients alpha and beta are inverses of each other, just like the RWN space time. And there's meaningful things to be said about the mass function. I'm calling the mass function mu. The mass function is defined using the second metric coefficient, the beta, in this, according to this definition. This is the standard definition of the mass function. Uh, mu of infinity, so the limit of mu as r goes to infinity, is the ADM mass. And Tavo Darzade calls mu of zero, the bare mass, essentially the mass, you can maybe think of it as the mass that's contained at the location of the particle itself, right? It's the value of the mass function at zero. It's meaningful to call it the bare mass in this case because he proves this relationship holds. So the, if you think about what this, this is saying, this is the Einstein equation, E equals mc squared, but this, this is the E that's the, energy in the electric field. And it's saying that it's, it's equal to the mass, the, the total mass of the space-time minus the mass at the origin. So it, I think this is exactly what you should expect, right? The, let's say mass and energy are the same thing, except for a factor of C squared. Then it's saying the total energy of the space-time is equal to the energy at, at the singularity plus the energy of the electromagnetic field. So this happens as long as all these constants are finite, but they are actually finite for, for Born-Infeld and for a, a large class of these Lagrangians. 
A curious fact is that if you want to have a naked singularity to actually model a point particle in your space time this way, then your bare mass actually has to be non-positive. You think about it right here, if essentially you want naked singularity means you don't want this beta function to ever be zero. So the value of mu at r equals zero has to be non-positive. So maybe, you know, if you want to call it mass, maybe a few physicists will not be so happy with that because it's negative mass. So question? Yes, please. Why don't you choose mu of zero equals zero? I mean, that would make your beta better behave at the origin. You could. There, so there are there are solutions in this class of Lagrangians that has that have mu of zero equals zero, which means the then the, the space time is even. Uh, yeah, you can extend it to r equals zero as well. It doesn't have a conical singularity in there. Okay, let me also mention that this uh, von Rinfeldt uh, solution radially symmetric. Uh, you can already find them in books by Bronikov in the eighties. And uh, one property is this: that even if you choose mu of zero equals zero, so this you still get a singularity. You get a conical singularity in the metric, nevertheless. So. Uh, even okay. though some papers might be saying that these metrics are regular or not. Yeah. yeah, that's that's good to know. I, I don't actually know if if in here in, in Tavadar Zadeh's work, he he said specifically says that it would be regular if mu is well, zero. Maybe, maybe he doesn't has say a that. General, has a general theorem uh, about nonlinear uh, Maxwell fields that uh, uh, they they essentially all of them or I, yeah i don't remember the details now but there's a very large class of uh nonlinear lagrangians for f so that even though uh, you get rid of the singularity at r equals zero uh in the so that the metric does not blow up or something like that you still uh, you end up for this general class of fields with a conical singularity at the origin and uh, uh, and this includes the bone info theory. Okay. Now that's interesting. I'll, I'm going to take a look at that. And in, in this paper, in this particular paper, he's also talking about several other theories. So Born Infeld is included here, but some maybe there's an overlap. Uh, and maybe the, the symmetric difference of the, these two papers is non empty. So who is, uh, who is T? Tavildar Zadeh. Oh, okay. Right here. So yeah, 2011, all right. Right, so the papers uh, mm -hmm. from Bronico, but I'm afraid I don't know a English reference, but there was a book in Russian by him published in the uh -huh. 80s, Bronico and Menikov probably or something like that, which okay. has these, these theorems. And I, I'm sure that has been re re uh, translated or you know, re 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 the results reprinted in some papers by Bronico. I'll try to take a look, thank you. Okay, going back here. So yeah, I'm not only mentioning all of this about these other theories of electromagnetism because I want to compare them to what we can do in, with our Maxwell BLTP. And then uh, the other work that I want to mention is BKT. This is more recent. So the question that they are asking here, this is Burcher, Kiesling, and Tafel uh, they They're saying, Essentially, if, for example, if for fluids, the second Bianchi identity implies the relationship for the divergence free of T mu nu, which is, can be considered as the equations of motion. So if you, if you have now a space time with a bunch of singularities, which are point particles, and you want, you want to formulate equations of motion for these singularities, then what you need is actually some form of the, the weak, a weak form of the, of the second Bianchi identity in order to uh, some, some form of this equation that holds at these locations, which are not actually part of the space time, but they're limiting points of the space time, right? So they are studying in this particular paper, a weak form of them, uh, sufficient conditions for it to hold for static and spherically symmetric space times. And the sufficient conditions that they have are, unfortunately, they don't apply to my case here. They, the two metric coefficients have to be Alpha and beta have to be inverses of each other, just like in the Borning Feld case, but not for us. And the bare mass has to be strictly negative as well. And the technique that they use, uh, it's an idea originally by Bray and Jaurigi, 2009. 
it's the idea of a zero area singularity. You, you define a new coordinate row that essentially blows up the singularity into a surface. And there's a formula for rho depending on the beta metric coefficient that I'm just saying here because I want to point out later that it doesn't work for our case. All right. So we, I can actually now go back to the Maxwell BLTP system. So what happens if you take your static spherically symmetric space time and you put in the Lagrangian for MBLTP? And then you get the, the T mu nu from that, and then you, you write down the Einstein equations for that. These are the Einstein equations. Um, where I've, I've actually now assumed, and I'm going to do this from now on, the constant C, Q, and kappa, kappa is that special constant of the theory. I'm just assuming there are one, so I'm, I'm redefining my variables to be dimensionless. And now whenever you see a G, it actually stands for this particular combination, dimensionless combination that's a multiple of the Newton constant. And I should say it's a really, really small constant. So G is now really small. And I say that even though we don't know what the value of this kappa constant is, it's, you know, it would be some constant of nature, but BLTP theory is not actually the, the nature, the theory of nature. Um, but it, even if you imagine kappa to be as large as it could be, like the inverse of the Planck length, this is still a really small number. You have a C to the fourth in the denominator. And as long as you're, you're talking about the charge of a particle, like an electron. So yeah, this is really small. So of course, the idea to study solutions of the system is by perturbation. You have nonlinear perturbation terms in each of the equations containing a G in them. So you study the equations for G equals zero and perturb them. And there is a work from 2016 studying this system that says if you actually have a horizon, so you're not studying naked singularities or point particles, you're just studying this theory for the sake of it. And if you have a strictly positive R where the beta metric coefficient is zero, then actually the only physically meaningful solution outside of this horizon is still the reisner nordstrom spacetime, which surprisingly, it's still a solution to this system, even though you have now a more general uh, theory of electromagnetism. Uh, but this doesn't apply for us because we are actually looking for a solution that's valid in the entire R interval from zero to infinity. All right. so. And the, the idea is the idea of their proof doesn't hold for our case. And in fact, I'm going to show that there, there is a, uh, you can find a solution, a meaningful solution. Meaningful means it has a finite energy. So let's talk about this energy. The electric field energy to any solution of, of any solution of that system, it's this particular integral. Again, some integral that you, you get from the T mu nu uh, tensor. And so now let's say you're looking for solutions which have this quantity finite. The integrability of this quantity for away from zero, so let's say at r equals infinity, is granted. As long as you can, you can find your solutions having the good asymptotics at r equals infinity, if you remember those were the asymptotics, then there's no problem here. Then the, this, fun, this integrand behaves as one over r squared for large r, and that's integrable but the integrability around zero is more complicated. So you can prove some integrations by parts, some clever arguments that close to zero. What do you need? Uh, uh, a necessary and sufficient condition is the integrability of this particular function here. So the square root alpha beta, chi minus one over R square. And in that case, you can prove the, the value of the energy is the same as it was in flat space compared, comparing to the electric potential phi. So as I mentioned, the RWN, riser nordstrom spacetime is still a solution to this more general system for all values of G, but it has infinite energy. So it's not good for us. We're, we, we want to prove that there is another solution with a finite energy. And also, as I mentioned before, if the Newton constant were actually zero, it's, it is a really small number, but if it was actually zero, then of course the flat space solution still solves this system. You know, there is no coupling to, of the Einstein equations to T mu nu anymore. Then, and the flat space solution in these variables is written like this. The metric coefficients are just one. So I'm calling the flat space solution alpha zero, beta zero. 
And uh, the chi function turns out to be this one, one plus r times e to the minus r for flat space. So this is the, the theorem uh, that you can find in my thesis and soon in some, some form in a paper. The theorem is there is some g star, some really small number such that for all g up to that number, there exist good solutions. More precisely, there exist constants a, b, and m depending on the g and a solution that I'm calling alpha g, beta g, chi g over all values of r satisfying these, the following asymptotics as r goes to zero and uh, as r goes to infinity respectively. So first, r goes to infinity. Um, so the metric coefficients, they're gonna approach the riser nordstrom metric as you would expect with an exponentially small correction. So this is actually slightly wrong here. I, I think the, the way we can, what you can actually prove is this should be O of e to the minus, there is some strictly some number that's strictly smaller than one here than minus zero point nine r, but that doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, and uh, even the chi function has this exponentially small difference. All right, and what happens at r equals zero? So the metric coefficient alpha actually still it's actually going to blow up, but it's going to blow up really really mildly. Remember that g is a really small constant. And this A here is, is between 1.9 and 2. But the beta coefficient, this will be a conical singularity if, uh, of the, the spatial metric, only, only the beta part. Um, it doesn't go to one, but it goes to a number slightly larger than one. Uh, but in particular, the, these asymptotics are good enough for the finiteness of the field energy. So the electric field energy is finite. And furthermore, as you would expect, point-wise at any, any r, as you take the Newton constant to zero, then this solution approaches the flat space solution because it's a perturbation of it. So that's the theorem. Uh, stark contrast to that result that I mentioned from 2016 that, that said, if you, have a, uh, if you actually have a black hole, then outside of black hole, the only solution is riser nordstrom But if you don't have one, you actually you can have a solution with a finite energy. So that means all the stuff that I talked about in the beginning, the, the program of, you know, what if you, have, if you now have two particles, how are they gonna move? How are they gonna evolve? The things that you could not do with just Maxwell equations, now you can possibly do with these. And that's something that I've been looking into recently. So I want to mention a few of the good properties about the solution and then the bad properties. Um, it actually, so the, the, the fact that the square root of alpha beta blows up at r equals zero and is decreasing immediately implies this. So this is contrary. This is different from that result from Tavo day. The, this nice balance between electromagnetic energy, ADM mass, and bare mass. The energy is now strictly larger than that. So maybe this, this is saying that mu of zero should not be considered like a bare mass in this case. So question, so yes. this mu of zero, I mean, how is it related to these constants A, B, and uh, G that you had? Is this the term, or is this a free parameter? Or? It will be zero, actually. It will be zero. Oh, okay. Yes, in, in in the solution that I that I found, the, okay. the ones that I found, it, it will be zero. That's true. Uh, so I, I should actually say this more generally: for any solution of of the system for which these constants are finite, this will be satisfied. And for the ones that I found, which I, I I'm pretty sure are not the unique ones for the system, then mu zero is actually zero. All right, uh, the Kretschmann scalar, it still blows up just like in the Tafel Darza day work, but it blows up much more mildly as compared to the riser Nordstrom space time. So yeah, there is a, a singularity at the origin. Uh, yeah, so this is right here. The, since the, essentially the, here's the argument. My, my solution is a perturbation of the flat space metric, which has beta equals one. So the, the value of beta at the origin is going to be slightly different from one, but just the fact that it's not zero immediately implies the bare mass has to be zero for this particular solution. 
And so the, if you want to now study the a form of the weak Bianchi identity for the space time, the ideas that you find in BKT don't work anymore. Here, here's the formula of the, the coordinate row that, that's used for that work. Uh, this, will, this is going to blow up uh, this integral because beta of zero is non-zero. This integral behaves like one over R around R equals zero, so it explodes. Which doesn't mean there, there is no formulation of the weak Bianchi identity. It just means you have to be more clever to find one. Uh, I haven't started this doing this specific thing yet, but this is in my plans. Uh, and then as it turns out, I want to go back to the theorem, point out something that's physically unsatisfying. The way that the theorem work, works is for all values of G, you find constants A, B, M. So in particular, they depend on G. So you cannot actually stipulate the ADM as of your space-time a priori. So let's say you want, to, you want to use this theory to model a certain particle that has a mass of whatever. You cannot do that. The M that you find depends on the G that you're using. And I could not prove this. Uh, rigorously, but numeric experiments suggests the M that I find for this solution is always one half or reintroducing the constants. This is the, the mass of the particle. I don't know if there's any physical meaning to this particular combination. Um, but again, this is a reason why I believe there are more solutions to be found because what you would expect from a physical point of view is for, for any M that you wish or maybe small enough M you should be able to find a space-time having that M as the ADMS, just like in, in Riser and Nordstrom, where it's a free parameter. Uh, yeah, I guess we have time for a little bit of the proof idea. I want to say I don't recommend anybody read the thesis. The reason why it's taking a long time to turn this into a paper is because it's, it's long in the thesis. It's messy. It, it does work, but it's just a a messy problem with a lot of calculations, and I can try to explain them in a few slides here. So this is the problem. For a small g, we seek a solution of this system, satisfying asymptotic properties, which are given as limits when r is infinity, and they are given as integrability of a certain function around r equals zero. This is what you'd like to solve. So this is not an initial value problem. It's, it's a system of ODEs, but not initial value problem because you, didn't, you don't know where, you don't know the value at any value of R. You just have asymptotic property. So you're gonna study this as some heteroclinic orbit of a dynamical system. That's the idea. I wanna point out that the equation for chi is of second order. The others are first order. And I also want to point out that alpha doesn't really appear in the two other equations. The, the, the two last equations. So you can basically just focus on these two and then solve them. Whatever you get for them for the solution, you plug back into the first one and get alpha from there. So the alpha equation or the square root of alpha beta equation is not a problem. All right. So what is the solution idea? I'm going to study the two regimes separately, large and small r. So as I said, ignore the alpha equation or square root of alpha beta. And also consider a new unknown, I'm calling it epsilon, which is the chi prime. This is the standard thing that you do. If you have, you have a second order equation for chi, so just call chi prime epsilon. Now you have a first order system. And I'll fix some positive value of R and search for solutions only starting at R0 onwards. I'm gonna be searching them as power series in G. You expect them to exist because the the equations are analytic in G, right? So they are even a linear function of G. And it turns out you can do that. One finds, asterisk, I'm going to talk about that later, but one finds that the, the, you can find solutions parametrized by two parameters, M and N. So more precisely, there are, there are constants M star, M star, G star, such that for every M and N small enough, so small enough being uh, stipulated by these m star m star and for all g is more enough there are solutions and i'm calling them large so beta large chi large epsilon large they depend on g and they depend on m and n as two parameters so there are these solutions 
on this interval of large R, satisfying the good asymptotics as R goes to infinity. And now we can read the asterisk. The way that this is done, this is where all the calculations are. Uh, I've, I've found a technique, suitable technique for proving the convergence of a power series whose coefficients are recursively defined as polynomials of the previous coefficients with a fixed degree. This actually appears a lot in, in systems like this, where in the physics liter literature, nobody really proves the convergence. Um, there, are, there are some easy arguments to say that uh, to, to, to say that they must converge for a small enough g, let's say, but this was all quantitative because I needed this quantitative estimate. And this is where all the, the calculations go, but yeah, you can do this. So these solutions are gonna be continuous in the parameters, even actually analytic in, this, in these parameters. The parameter that I'm calling m is actually the ADMS of the space time. And the other one, the n, I have no idea what it is. It, it may have some physical meaning because it, it shows up in the equation for chi, the, the electric potential. It contains the electric potential, but I don't know what it is exactly. So good. With this, you have good solutions for large R. Let's talk about small r. You can try the same thing, but it's not so nice. Uh, as a power series in G for small r, it just doesn't work. The equations are too complicated. Maybe there is a clever way to rewrite them, but I couldn't find that. So the approach for small r is actually different. I'm going to transform some of the variables. I'm going to be using our new variables, x, y, and z. They are defined in this way. And R itself, I'm going to consider R itself also as a dependent variable of a dynamical system. And I'm, I'm saying, let's say T is, the, is, a, is a variable. It's actually the log of R, I believe. Uh, and a new independent variable. So you can, you can reformulate your dynamical system in a way that it becomes just an autonomous dynamical system with a polynomial right-hand side. This is also a standard thing to do, uh, but finding these particular functions, the ones that work, this is motivated by the exactly the expression that I wanted to be integrable. With this, with this change, it, something stronger happens. That, that expression that I wanted to be integrable actually will have a limit, will be even continuous at r equals zero. So yeah, this, this was motivated by that. And then now you have a dynamical system. And as it turns out, the, the orbits of this dynamical system that have uh, an alpha limit, so limit as t goes to minus infinity, those orbits correspond to solutions of our original system that have the good asymptotics as r goes to zero. So what does this mean? It means that you're now interested in the unstable manifold of this dynamical system around its one of its equilibrium points at r equals zero. It actually has three of them, but only one is the physically meaningful one. So you want to now study the unstable manifold of a dynamical, four-dimensional dynamical system. But I'm pointing out here that other solutions of the system with the good asymptotics at r equals zero may actually still exist. So the ones that I'm looking for are just sufficient for our purposes. Maybe there are some others that are also good. All right. As it turns out, the unstable manifold of the, of the system around its equilibrium point at r equals zero has a power series parametrization because the right-hand side of it is analytic in, in all the unknowns. So this is a theorem. You can find the power series parametrization of it. It actually is a two-dimensional manifold. So this will be a power series in two variables. And you can find recursive formulas for the coefficients of this power series. So it's, we are back at the same situation now. We have a power series whose coefficients are recursively defined as polynomial expressions of the previous coefficients, but with a fixed degree on this polynomial. So you prove convergence of this power series and some estimates. So what you find, here, here's the uh, footnote, that's a modification of the previous technique, this time for a multivariable power series. And what you find is a constant p star, such that for all p, so 
So there will be only one parameter B here for all small enough B and for all small enough G, it turns out to be one over 60 here and small enough R, there are solutions satisfying the good asymptotics that R equals zero. And these solutions have the script small here. They are valid between zero and R zero. Uh, all right, so it's same situation as before, but now only one parameter. And these solutions are continuous in this parameter. So this proof actually cannot find any solutions with a negative bare mass, or in other words, a value of beta equals zero, as I pointed out before. But at least in the, for the case G equals zero, there are actually solutions with a negative bare mass. So you expect them to also exist maybe for G positive. This is no proof, but it's a, a statement of hope, I'd say. So maybe there should be an alternate proof for positive G, uh, but it turns out to be harder than expected. I, I, don't, I don't think it's gonna be any small modification of the idea here. A, a new idea is needed for this. So anyway, yeah, what do you have now? You have a family, a two parameter family of solutions of the original system. So when I say original system, I mean the three variables, beta, chi, and chi prime, which is epsilon. Right. Remember that I'm forgetting about the alpha equation. So you have this three dimensional dynamical system. You have a two parameter family coming from R infinity, and you have one parameter family coming from zero. Of course, you expect them to intersect in a single point. And if you, could, if you can get them to intersect, you're done. So, what is the idea there? Now, fix the small enough G, fix the appropriate R zero. It actually has to be not so small, but not so large turns out to be around one half. Um, so take the two parameter family of the good solutions coming from infinity. Evaluate it at this particular R, R zero. So they're gonna trace out a three dimensional surface when the parameters vary. So I'm calling that SG, the surface of the good solutions from large R. So here, here's the definition of that surface. This particular point in three dimensional space as the parameter values M and N vary. So this is a surface. Uh, as I remind you, the functions are continuous in M and N. And then similarly, the one parameter family of solutions coming from R equals zero, they're gonna trace out a curve as the parameter P varies. So I'm calling that CG, C for curve. And what you wanna prove is that SG and CG intersect. How do you do that? Well, they do intersect when G is zero because the flat space solution exists. So you just want to know that turning G on, making G a little bit uh, non-zero, but, but still small, doesn't change these S and G objects so much. So you estimate the distance between S, G and S zero and C, G and C zero. That's why I needed some quantitative estimates for my power series. And it's actually the Poincaré Miranda theorem that's used to prove that parameter values P, M, and N exist at which the, you can find an intersection of these. So I have a meaningless picture here of the situation. You have the original C0 curve, which is actually a straight line, a green line, and the original S0 surface, which is actually a plane, they intersect. And then SG in red is a little modification of the plane as zero. And CG in blue is a little modification of the curve C0 in green. So if the green and purple intersected and you change them just a little, they're still gonna intersect. Yeah, anyway, that was the proof idea. So some of the things that I mentioned during the talk about future work. I think this is the main idea now. The, the thing that I still believe is true um, if I could actually have a two parameter family of solutions for a small r instead of one parameter, and maybe the value of the bare mass could be the other parameter here, well, then, then the situation is completely different. You have two surfaces intersecting in that three dimensional space, so you have a whole family of possible solutions. So, presumably, what's going to happen is then you, you have enough, you have infinitely many solutions, you, you can possibly then find solutions having either the bare mass or the ADM as specified a priori, instead of coming out from the theorem as some random value. 
which is desirable from a physical point of view. So yeah, this is what I'd still, I believe this should be true to actually find a more general class of solutions to this space time. Once you can do that, then maybe try to prove the second Bianchi identity for the singularity of this space time. Maybe only the case of strictly negative bare mass because this is also, it, it turns out this is a really important condition in the work of BKT. So if you have all that, then, then you can start talking about evolution of particles. So now what, what happens if you put two particles in your space time? Now, it's a completely different problem, right? You don't have a spherically symmetric space time anymore. It's not actually symmetric. How are these gonna, these two particles gonna evolve, these two singularities? Assuming now that you actually already have a form of the BNK identity that holds at these singularity locations. Um, and yes, for an actually symmetric space time, you actually have PDEs instead of ODEs. It's a completely different problem. So those are some of the things that I've been occupied with. Um, I think, yeah, those are, again, my references. I just want to thank you, everybody, for, for being here, for the opportunity of giving this talk, even though I'm not physically present in there. Thank you for the attention.